Hello everyone, uh, I'm Dane Logan and I'm the communication manager here at The Ridge. Um, I wonder, are you tired of gifts yet? It's been probably weeks if not months of shopping for gifts, wrapping gifts, more recently opening gifts, and then trying to figure out what the heck to do with all that gift wrap once you've gotten it unwrapped. Um, so my guess is the last thing you want to hear somebody like me talk about today is gifts. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint, but gifts are going to feature prominently in today's message, but I'm not going to go there right away. Where I want to start this morning is with a real brief history lesson. So for those of you who are joining us live today, it's December 26th. It's the day after Christmas. It's also known as Boxing Day. So happy Boxing Day. If you have no clue what I'm talking about, trust me, you're probably in good company. Boxing Day isn't a traditional holiday here in the U.S., but it is celebrated a lot of other places around the world. Predominantly, it's celebrated in the U.K., Ireland, Australia, and a few other places that were once occupied by the British government. Um, so it was established by Queen Victoria in the 1830s, and it was traditionally meant to be a day of charity. The idea was pretty simple, um, and it was actually aptly named. The idea would be that the more wealthy, affluent members of British society would take the day after Christmas and give gifts to the various people who serve them throughout the year. So think like postal workers, errand boys, or household servants. And traditionally, they would give a gift in a box to these folks. Sometimes it would be an actual present, other times it would just be money. But again, the idea was charitable giving from those who are well off, well, well off to those who are less fortunate. It's a pretty admirable idea, I think, and I, I would suspect that maybe you agree. Well, I can't tell you precisely what inspired Queen Victoria a couple hundred years ago to initiate this holiday, but I can tell you that Boxing Day has some interesting parallels to the Christmas story, at least the part of it that we find in Matthew chapter two. So Matthew chapter two recounts the story of the Magi, or as maybe you would know them more commonly, the three kings or the three wise men. So let's get into it. Here is Matthew's account of that story. He writes, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. So there's more to this story. That's just the um, opening scene, let's say. And I'm going to get to that here in just a minute. But I want to take a second to pause and reflect on the first few verses that we just encountered, because there's some important stuff here, especially about who these magi were. It's not a term that we hear a lot today. So what was a magi and what did they do? Well, the term magi, when you look it up, um, it, it, it refers to a subclass of Persian priests. Now, these guys were admired for their wisdom, which is maybe where the idea of three wise men came from, but they were um, mostly concerned with the natural sciences. And if you think about what that might've looked like 2000 years ago, that in large part involved the study of the stars, AKA the heavens. And because this was a religious society that we were growing up in here, um, a lot of that had to do with trying to look for signs and wonders from God. They felt that if they could perceive what was going on in the cosmos, they could better understand what God was up to and what his will was. They saw any changes in the natural environment as evidence of God's hand at work. And actually, because these guys spent a lot of time studying the stars, that's likely what prompted their trip to Jerusalem in the first place. The guess is they knew where the planets were supposed to be, where the stars were supposed to be, and something was off. And they needed to investigate that, and that's what led them ultimately to follow that star to Jerusalem. So that's one thing that we can observe about the Magi from those first few verses. A second thing that we see 
is that these guys' presence, these Magi's presence in Jerusalem was noticed by the people and by King Herod. Herod showed a lot of interest in their search for the, quote, King of the Jews. And this is largely because we think now that these Magi had a certain amount of clout and reputation. These were people whose wisdom, their learning, maybe their wealth preceded them. And so when they showed up in your town, people took notice. They weren't just innocuous, um, unnoticed passers-by. These were people of note, of importance. And so Herod noticed them and took note of what it was that they were up to. So from these first few passages, we see that these wise men are, are knowledgeable. They, um, they're studious, right? They study the stars, the cosmos. They're also likely influ influential because of their position and because of their wealth in the society at that point in time. The third thing I want to point out here is something that's actually not noticed in the text, but maybe noticed because of its omission from the text. We don't see in the verses that we just read any reference to how many wise men there were. So if I were to ask you that, I think intuitively most of you would say, well, there were three wise men. Maybe some kids that are watching would have been able to pick up on that right away. But the fact is, in the verses that we just read, Matthew is completely mute on this. He never actually numbers the wise men. And in fact, there are some cultures throughout the world that would say that there are 12 wise men. Traditionally, they celebrate it as a group of 12. Um, so three, 12, somewhere in the middle. My take today is I don't really actually care because I don't think Matthew actually cared all that much. It certainly wasn't something that rose to a level of importance that he felt the need to enumerate the wise men in scripture for us today. So less important than the number to Matthew is what these wise men were doing and ultimately what their actions tell us about Jesus. So let's pick up the story there and see what the wise men do next. Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. Now, big time spoiler alert here, Herod is lying right through his teeth in a pretty big way, and we'll see that lie come out here in just a little while. Continuing then, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, that's pretty much the version of the wise men story or the magi story that I suspect most of you are familiar with. We've all heard some version of this and their three gifts are probably the most um, famous portion of this passage of the Bible. But let's pause for a minute and peel back a few of the layers on this well-trodden, well-known story and see what else we can learn about these magi and the actions that they took. To me, the magi actually do some pretty important stuff here. The first of which we've already talked about, but it's worth repeating. They continue to follow the, sky, the star. Um, again, these magi spend a lot of time looking at the night sky. They know where stuff's supposed to be, and it seems like there was an anomaly of some sort that night. They didn't know or they couldn't account for something that they saw in that sky. And so they took it upon themselves to investigate that odd occurrence. And this is what led them ultimately to Bethlehem. They also, a second thing that they did that's noteworthy is when they found Jesus, again, a baby, an infant, they found him and their first action as accounted in Matthew was to bow down and worship him. Now, these magi, in addition to being astronomers, were also priests. And so they were likely well acquainted with the books of the Old Testament and the various prophecies contained within the Old Testament. There were certain signs that they knew they ought to look for. So, for example, the star itself is a sign that was prophesied in the book of Numbers. 
And this one probably had particular importance to the Magi, given that they concerned themselves so much with study of the cosmos. A second sign they knew to look for was the town of Bethlehem itself. So as much as they might have been excited by the sighting of the star, my guess is those wheels spun even faster in their head when they realized that star was leading them to Bethlehem because in the book of Micah, it sets Bethlehem apart as the birthplace of the promised Messiah. The third sign that would have been important to them is the presence of Mary and her claim to have been a virgin. This is prophesied in the book of Isaiah. So the triple whammy of the star, the town of Bethlehem, and then the virgin birth would have given them a lot of evidence to suggest that this was indeed the prophesied Messiah. And so it makes sense then that they bowed down and worshipped him in that moment. The third thing the Magi do, and again the most famous of all their actions, is they present Jesus with a number of treasures. So let's look at these one by one. The first treasure that they presented to Jesus, do you remember what it was? Yeah, it was gold. Gold makes a lot of sense to me as a potential gift for a king. Gold's rare, it's valuable, it's gold. Like kings have been obsessed with gold for a very long time simply because of its rarity and the valuable nature of it. So to me, gold is a pretty fitting gift to give to a king. We don't need to dwell on that one too much. But the other two are a bit more of a head scratcher. What are frankincense? What are myrrh? And then what did these guys, why? Why did they decide to give these as gifts to Jesus? Well, let's start with frankincense. Um, what we know is that frankincense is and was a type of perfume or incense. And that might seem kind of run of the mill today. In fact, in the last several weeks, I've seen lots of ads for Macy's calling it the ultimate fragrance destination this Christmas. We give a lot of perfume out at Christmas time. But back then, that wasn't so much the case. Perfume, frankincense, incense, these things were much more difficult to make and as a result, they are more rare and more valuable. Let's think for a minute, take yourself, and let's transport back 2,000 years to Israel, right? It was hot, it was dry, there was no running water, and oh to boot, there were a ton of livestock just hanging around. There's a sheep over there, a goat over there, a donkey hanging out over there. In other words, I'm guessing it was a pretty stinky place. And so as a result, this might have made some sense. Now, I don't live on a farm personally, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I know enough about animals to know that they are pretty unsanitary beings. In fact, at this year's Ridge Fall Festival, my family and I were hanging out at the petting zoo when a bunch of children and even a few uh, adults started to shriek. We turned our eyes to see what the commotion was all about and we're um, interested to see a donkey, how do I put this delicately, relieving himself on the hoof of another donkey. So we saw it, we heard it, we smelled it, and then that second donkey, yeah, he felt it. Absolutely disgusting, right? But imagine if that was commonplace in society as it was in Israel a couple thousand years ago. And so again, my guess is perfume, a pretty valuable substance and actually a pretty fitting gift for a king. Which brings us of course to our third and final gift, the gift of myrrh. Now myrrh, frankly, is the most surprising of all three of the gifts that the wise men offered to Jesus that day. So I did a little bit of digging on this and I came across a really cool commentary from a woman named Kristen Swenson. Now she's an associate professor of religious studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. And according to what she's um, studied, she's discovered that myrrh was used in ancient Egypt as part of the embalming process, which is kind of odd. This has led some Christian scholars to theorize that the gift of myrrh actually foreshadowed the death of Jesus. Now actually myrrh does make another appearance in the gospel a few books later in Mark uh, 15, 23, when Jesus is being led to his crucifixion. During that uh, procession, he's offered wine with myrrh mixed in it as what we think was kind of a painkiller. Now Jesus rejects that offer, um, but it's also just an interesting sort of parallel to the myrrh that he was given at his birth. Finally, Swinson also reports, this is our professor um, from VCU, that myrrh was used in the, the oil um, that was used to anoint kings. 
And so this is perhaps the most significant parallel to Jesus in that the wise men believed that they had come to see and worship the king. Um, So kind of a a cool gift, actually, if you break it down a little bit more. So these are the three gifts. I'm going to return to them a little bit here in just a moment. But first, I think it's worth marching this story a little bit further down the line and seeing what it is that the Magi do next. So pulling open scripture again, we're now in Matthew chapter 2, verse 12, and it, it reads as follows. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now earlier, I gave you a spoiler alert that Herod had told the Magi to, after finding Jesus, to return to him and report upon his location so that he could, quote, worship him. Now, again, Herod had no intentions of doing so, so the Magi probably made a pretty good determination in going a different way home. Reading on then, here's what happened after these guys left Bethlehem. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Again, he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old or younger. Put plainly, Herod was ticked and he was going to do something about it. Now, this is kind of cool in a lot of respects in that it would appear that the Magi had arrived with their valuable gifts just in the nick of time. Um, The passage makes it clear that Jesus' family really escaped the clutches of Herod to Egypt by the skin of their teeth. And at first that sounds great, right? Like, whoo, the hero got away, the day is saved, all is good. And, And perhaps that's true, but when I pause a minute and reflect on the events that just took place, I gotta be honest, it's a bit of a head scratcher for me. So some specifics, I'm mostly plagued by the question, why? Why? I mean, what's the point in making the Messiah, God's son, the savior of all mankind, be born to a poor family in a barn in a desert? Oh, and by the way, under the rule of a murderous king. Like, I could think of about a thousand better ways to script that that would give Jesus a lot better chance at success going forward. Additionally, what's the point in making a woman who had just recently given birth flee hundreds of miles to a foreign country? And what's the point in making magi travel hundreds of miles in order to bring those valuable gifts that the family would need to escape to that faraway country? Because an easier route presents itself to me, and that would be, why not make Jesus born a prince in a palace? And if I'm casting this narrative, I probably would swap the roles of Mary and Joseph out for a kind and peaceful and benevolent king and queen. I would probably go ahead and cast off Israel as well and land him in a peaceful kingdom so that from day one, Jesus would have all the power, all the wealth, and all the resources he would need to succeed because that sounds like a really good plan to me. And frankly, I think it would have been a lot easier on God as well. In fact, like the whole creation thing, the idea of free will and a partnership between God and mankind, seems like it's just prone to go poorly when when men enter the equation. It's probably tempting for God to just program us so that we do his will from day one, but also that presents some problems. Um, I'll, I'll explain this through a metaphor from my own life. I'm a parent too, just like God is our Heavenly Father. I've got a nine-year-old boy and a seven-year-old daughter. 
And I remember distinctly a couple years ago, my daughter brought home um, an art project that she was told to work on from home to then take back to school and present to her class. So I sat there and I watched her attempt to work with scissors and glue through gritted teeth. And then eventually I couldn't take it anymore. And I sidled up to her and I said, hey, honey, why don't you hand those scissors to me for a minute? And I'll give you a little hand. And so 45 minutes later, the project's done the right way to be completely clear. My daughter is off into the room watching TV and it looks really good, but you have to ask the question, is it my daughter's project anymore? And, and the answer is probably no. And then the second question is, did she learn anything from her minimal involvement in that project? Well, no, the only thing that she learned probably is that daddy's gonna rescue her. And that's probably not the best message for her to take away from that moment in time. I firmly believe that God's a better parent than I am simply because he doesn't demand complete control. He doesn't always follow the path of least resistance. In fact, he chooses to enter into a relationship, into a partnership with us, broken, sinful people. He chooses to give us talents and gifts and to bless us with resources because, and this is the most important thing, God wants to build his kingdom through us. He doesn't want to do it all himself. He could, but he chooses to build that kingdom through us. That's why he sent Jesus to be born in a barn in the desert. That's why he sent the Magi on that cross-country journey to deliver the valuable gifts that Jesus and his family would need. And that's why he calls you and me to do his kingdom work here on earth all throughout the Bible. God calls us to be prepared to sacrifice our wealth to help those in need. A little later on in Matthew, in fact, Jesus will tell his disciples, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Which brings us back to Boxing Day, to December 26th, the day after Christmas. It brings us back to that Victorian day of goodness and kindness and charity. And again, it's beautiful, right? This idea of paying it forward. I think God would very much be a fan of Boxing Day. I think that would get his stamp of approval. Sadly, 200 years on, Boxing Day looks a little bit different now than it did once upon a time. Today, it looks a little bit more like this. Yeah, it's a crowded shopping mall full of people packing into stores. It's stores putting discounts on the stuff they didn't sell during Christmas. And it's a little bit like what we would call the time-honored tradition of Black Friday. In fact, in recent years, that comparison has been made by a lot of people that Boxing Day has become the British equivalent of American Black Friday. So rather than taking this day to pay their blessings forward, to bless the less fortunate, many people have decided that Christmas was not enough to satisfy their consumerist needs and demands. And they've taken the day after Boxing Day, this day of charity, as an opportunity, as an excuse to pile even more gifts on an already large pile. The day has become about us. It's become about self rather than loving and serving others. And here's the thing, guys. People are absolutely free to make that choice. God does not twist our arm and say that we have to be charitable. He also gave the wise men some agency. They were, they were free to choose for themselves what they wanted to do those 2,000 years ago. And imagine if they had made a different choice. Imagine if instead of making that cross-country trip, the wise men had stayed home and they had a fun day at the market partying with their friends. What if they had stayed home to party instead of traveling hundred miles, hundreds of miles across the desert to find Jesus and his family in Bethlehem? What would have happened? Would, for example, Jesus have been forced to stay in Bethlehem? Would Herod have found Jesus when he did that hunt and had him killed? Would his birth his life, his death, his resurrection never have come to pass? Well, the answer is no. Because you see, God doesn't need us to help him with his projects on earth. He doesn't need us in order for his will to be done. 
even without the gifts of the Magi, God would have done what God does and he would have found a way to get Jesus out of Israel and into Egypt. And today, God doesn't need us to bless the less fortunate. He still holds them preciously in the palm of his hand. But here's the thing, even though God doesn't need us, he wants us to be involved. God wants us to use our gifts, our talents, our resources for good. He wants to bless the world through us because he knows that when we bless other people, we in turn are blessed because it draws us closer to the person and to the character of God. So today, the day after Christmas, Boxing Day, as you look at the spoils of the last several days, I challenge you, will you reflect on all that God has given you? Will you thank him for your blessings? Will you reflect on how you might be able to use your gifts, your talents, your resources to bless others and in doing so to, to fulfill God's promises? Will you ask God how he wants you to live today in accordance with his plans for your life? Will you ask him how you, like the Magi, like the original intent of Boxing Day, how you can live generously. I hope you will. Merry Christmas and happy Boxing Day. I'm going to close us in prayer.